Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 71 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Historians often refer to the Battle of Saratoga as the turning point of the American Revolution. They argue that the Patriot Army's defeat of General John Burgoyne's British force proved to the French that the Americans had what it took to defeat the professional British Army. As a result, the French entered the war on behalf of the American Patriots, and in 1781, the joint Franco-American force cornered Charles Earl Cornwallis at Yorktown, an action that ended the war and secured the Americans their independence. This is the quick, uncomplicated version of Saratoga and the end of the war. But as we know, history is more complicated than that. And today, we're going to explore the Saratoga campaign of 1777 in a bit more depth. Our guide for this exploration is Bruce Venter, author of The Battle of Hubberton, The Rearguard Action That Saved America. During our conversation, Bruce reveals the state of the American War for Independence in 1777, British General John Burgoyne's plan for capturing the Lake Champlain-Hudson River Corridor, and the important role the Battle of Hubberton played in the Patriots' victory at the Battle of Saratoga. But first, do you enjoy free books? Do you like discussing history ideas and current events? If so, you should join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook. The community is where I ask for questions for our guest historians and conduct book giveaways. It's also where listeners of the podcast connect and get to share their interests with one another. To join this group, all you need to do is click on the orange Join Now button on the BenFranklinsWorld.com homepage, or you can text BFWorld to 33444. Are you ready to explore the turning point of the American Revolution? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the president of American History LLC, a tour and conference company known for its annual conference about the American Revolution. He earned his doctorate in educational administration from the University at Albany, and he is the author of two books, Kill Jeff Davis, Union Raid on Richmond, and The Battle of Hubberton, The Rear Guard Action That Saved America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Bruce Venter. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Bruce, you have a really interesting career as a historian. You run a history tour and conference company, America's History LLC, and you moonlight as both General John Burgoyne and Charles Earl Cornwallis. Would you tell us about your company and your period reenacting? Sure. I was originally a history major in college, so I always had an interest in the study of history. I spent 36 years in public education as an assistant superintendent. But upon retirement, I decided to pursue history as an avocation. And so we started a company called America's History LLC. And we offer bus tours, usually three days, of topics ranging from the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, uh, the Indian Wars out west like Custer. And it's given us an opportunity to really tell a great story about America's history. And along the way, I ended up helping out a group in Smithfield, Virginia, who were doing a Patriots Day, and they didn't have any British presence. So I had just finished the tour of Saratoga campaign, and I decided to do an impression of General Burgoyne for them. And uh, I had my uniform made uh, in Colonial Williamsburg from a person who had worked there. And uh, it worked out very well. Unfortunately, people in Virginia are not that familiar with John Burgoyne. And so I quickly adapted uh, a character of Warren Cornwallis because the uniform is interchangeable. 
I do, General. We're going up in New York uh, every 4th of July for the Saratoga Springs All-American festivities, where I march in the parade and I give a talk about General Burgoyne's campaign, and that's been going on for about uh, six or seven years now. The Battle of Hubbardton is considered part of the Saratoga campaign. Did your reenacting of General John Burgoyne lead you to write a book about the Battle of Hubbardton? No, not really. I have a summer home on Lake George, and so I'm fairly near the Hubbardton battlefield. So I have been going to Hubbardton over the course of maybe 20-some years. My main purpose in writing the book was that there is no book on the Battle of Hubbardton currently in print before my book. In 1988, Colonel John Williams had written a book uh, for the state of Vermont, which they were selling in their uh, visitor center. That book went out of print about five years ago. And so I decided that a book was needed at the visitor center for people that would visit the battlefield and so that they could get an idea of what the battle was about. Hubbardton is covered in, of course, the major campaign studies of the Saratoga campaign. But, uh, but there isn't a, a specialized book just on Hubbardton. And so I fill the need, as they say. Let's explore Hubbardton and the Saratoga campaign. The Battle of Hubbardton took place on July 7, 1777. Bruce, what was the state of the War for Independence in July 1777? Well, let me go back a little bit to to give you a, a focus on that. You know, the war had gone fairly well for the Americans in 1775 with Lexington and Concord, and then the British evacuated Boston in early 1776, but then they came back and they captured New York City, and things were not going as well for the Americans in 1776. The British thought they could end the war. Unfortunately for the British, a man like Benedict Arnold was able to stymie them at Valcour Island in 1776 in the fall and uh, forced General Carleton, who was uh, the British commander in Canada, and also the governor of Canada, he decided to abort his campaign. And so the British were not able to invade uh, New York and capture Albany in 1776. General Burgoyne, who was second in command, saw this as an opportunity to present a plan to the king and the king's secretary of state, George Germain. And so Burgoyne, in February 1777, came up with a plan to capture Albany, but mostly control the Hudson River. And that would separate New England from the rest of the colonies, the middle and the southern colonies. And the British government thought that New England was their main problem for 10 years prior to the Revolution, from the Stamp Act crisis right up to Lexington and Concord, uh, things were pretty much concentrated in the Boston area and New England. And so the British point of view was, if we control the Hudson, we will be able to crush the rebellion. Burgoyne's plan in 1777 was a three-pronged attack to control that area. He was going to come down from Canada with a a large army, and capture Albany. He expected General William Howe, who at that point was the commander-in-chief in the colonies, to come up from New York City, which Howe had captured the previous year, and sail up the Hudson River and meet him in Albany. Burgoyne's plan also had a smaller force coming in through the Mohawk Valley under Barry Sun Ledger. And that force was going to be able to control the Mohawk Valley, which was actually a breadbasket for the Continental Army. The three forces would all meet in Albany. And as I say, Burgoyne would bring the champagne because that was his favorite drink, and they would toast a great victory in 1777. Unfortunately, as things worked out, um, that didn't happen. And I think the main problem with Burgoyne's campaign was that Howe did not cooperate. was the commander-in-chief, and so he could make his own plans, and he did get them approved by Germain, much to Burgoyne's distress. He decided to sail from New York City 
and capture Philadelphia and try to defeat George Washington, uh, which he did at the Battle of Brandywine. And so with the British not coming up the Hudson River, Burgoyne was left with a supply line that stretched all the way back to Canada once he got down into the area around Lake George, Fort Edward, and eventually the Saratoga area. Yeah, would you tell us about the geography of the Hudson Lake Champlain corridor? Because it seems like Burgoyne would have had a tough time moving an army of thousands of people on a supply train through that area. In the 18th century, water was the best way to move troops and materiel. And this was evident in the French and Indian War in the 1750s. And it would be the same in the Revolutionary War. There is a water corridor from Montreal, starting with the Richelieu River, and coming down to Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain is about 140 miles long. And so if you can float your men and your supplies up Lake Champlain, because Lake Champlain flows from south to north, he would be able to sail south on Lake Champlain for a good distance of this campaign at Fort Ticonderoga. There is a portage from Lake Champlain over to Lake George. Lake George is 32 miles long, and you can sail south on Lake George to the southern shore of the lake where there was a military road that had been built in 1755 by Sir William Johnson. You could take that military road for 14 miles over to Fort Edward and that would get you to the Hudson River. And, of course, the Hudson River flows down to Albany. So it was a very good waterway road to be able to use in the 18th century for Burgoyne. But in any case, he would always have to have his supply line stretched back to Canada, which makes the Saratoga campaign a classic study in logistics. Burgoyne's supplies had to come from Canada, and his reinforcements had to come from Canada. And so that created somewhat of a problem for him. We've talked about the British goals for the Saratoga campaign and their strategy and logistics. What about the Patriots? Did the Patriots have any goals or strategy for the Saratoga campaign? The Patriots' main goal, I see, as they wanted to hold on to Fort Ticonderoga. That was their, you might call the key to the continent, the the key to New York. And so their position was to hold Ticonderoga at all costs. They had captured Ticonderoga in 1775 with Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys assisted by Benedict Arnold. And so the capture of Ticonderoga and Crown Point, which was a few miles uh, down Lake Champlain from Fort Ticonderoga, gave the Patriots a good frontier in which to defend. They also were able to launch a campaign against Canada in 1775-76, as you know. So this was an important piece of real estate for the Patriots. And while Washington, of course, was fighting uh, with the main army uh, down around Pennsylvania and New Jersey area, The frontier was to be defended by Major General Philip Schuyler, who was commander of the Northern Department, and his troops that were uh, basically at Ticonderoga. And as I mentioned before, they were able to maintain that situation in 1776 when Carleton fought Benedict Arnold at Valcour Island, but then decided with the lateness of the year, it was October, not to pursue and capture Ticonderoga. Fort Ticonderoga is one of those places that our historic memory just doesn't do justice to because Fort Ty loomed large in the minds of early Americans, especially for those who lived in New York and New England. Would you tell us about the fort, where it is, and why it held such significance for Americans and for Britons, too? Fort Ticonderoga is located at the southern end of Lake Champlain. Now, Lake Champlain does extend about 20 miles further south, but it's a very narrow part of the lake. So Ticonderoga controlled 
the entrance to the main part of Lake Champlain. And the French saw this in uh, the 18th century. They already had a fort at Crown Point called Fort St. Frederick, and they used that fort to launch Indian raids uh, throughout New England and parts of New York in the early parts of the 18th century. At the beginning of the French and Indian War in 1755, Sir William Johnson's objective was to capture that fort at Crown Point. He was unsuccessful. Subsequently, the French decided to build a second fort at Ticonderoga in order to strengthen their position on Lake Champlain. And so the Americans always saw Ticonderoga as something special from their experience in the French and Indian War. Montcalm, after the fort was built, used it, and it was called Fort Carillon at the time, to uh, execute his campaign against Fort William Henry in 1757, which was the basis of the James Fenimore Cooper novel, The Last of the Mohegans, the, the reduction of Fort William Henry. And then in 1758, the British tried to capture it. Montcalm defended it successfully. And then in 1759, Jeffrey Amherst eventually captured Ticonderoga, and that was his corridor to Montreal. And Amherst was able to capture Montreal while Wolfe captured Quebec and gave Great Britain all of Canada as a result. So Ticonderoga would be very much instilled in the minds of New Englanders and New Yorkers as a very important geographical piece of real estate in the American mind. Earlier, you mentioned that Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold came into New York and captured Fort Ticonderoga in May 1775. And I always find this funny because in the records of the Albany Committee of Safety, it kind of reads, yeah, the New Englanders have invaded New York yet again because New York hadn't declared for the revolution one way or the other yet. But I wonder, what did the Patriots do with Fort Ticonderoga once they have it? I mean, it's if you've never been there, it's this big, massive stone fort. Well, that, the recreation is, is a stone fort. Actually, at the time, it was a, a log and dirt fort. The barracks were stone. But it had fallen into somewhat of disrepair by 1775. And it was manned by a let's say, a, a corporal's guard, to give someone an, an idea of how small the number of troops that were there. Uh, there was a captain commanding. And it, the British were not really thinking about the fact that that would, fort would ever be captured by the Americans. It was an audacious, an audacious bit of military uh, work on the part of Ethan Allen. But in May of 1775, Allen and Benedict Arnold captured the fort. Now, the most important part of that fort was the cannon that were still there. The cannon at Fort Ticonderoga and Crown Point, as most people know, were used by George Washington. He sent Henry Knox over in the dead of winter and brought out about 59 pieces of artillery and mortars and brought them to the city of Boston, where he laid siege to the British, and the British uh, were forced to evacuate as a result of the cannon that were brought over the Berkshires to Boston. Earlier, we discussed how John Burgoyne came down from Canada, and we've talked about his supply train. Could you tell us about the German soldiers and Native American warriors that accompanied the British Army? Burgoyne's army was about 9,000 men when he left Canada. And 7,000 of those men were regulars. Half of the regulars were British redcoats. The other half were German hirelings, basically from the Principality of Brunswick. There were some troops from Hesse-Hanau, and as, as you know, the Hesse-Hanau Principality supplied a great number of German troops to uh, Howe's army, and so American students generally always call the Germans Hessians in the American Revolution. But in Burgoyne's army, they were mostly Brunswickers. And they were under the command of Baron Friedrich von Redezo. And 
Burgoyne's army would have these Germans, they would have the Redcoats, and then they had a significant number of provincial troops, which uh, would be called Loyalists, uh, Americans mostly, some Canadians, that were raised for the purpose of fighting for the crown. Burgoyne would also have four to 500 Indians with his army, as well as some Canadians and actually some British seamen came along in that campaign. So Burgoyne, as I said, left Canada with about 9,000 men. To recap a little bit here, the Saratoga campaign was about the British attempt to cut New England off from the rest of the colonies. And this attempt consisted of three British forces. John Burgoyne's army that marched south from Canada, William Howe and Henry Clinton's army in New York City, and Barry St. Ledger's force that marched east along the New York Mohawk Valley. Burgoyne planned for all three of these armies to converge at Albany. But before Burgoyne could reach Albany, he had to go through the Patriot position at Fort Ticonderoga. Bruce, would you tell us about General Arthur Sinclair and the Patriot position at Fort Ty? Was Sinclair and his army ready for Burgoyne? Unfortunately, no. Like I said, the Americans had controlled Fort Ticonderoga since it was captured in May of 1775. During 1776, they had improved the fortifications around the fort. They had used uh, what we call the old French lines to the west of the fort that were built originally by Montcalm when he defended the fort in 1758. The Americans also had decided to fortify Rattlesnake Hill, which they renamed Mount Independence. That's directly across the lake on the east side of Lake Champlain from Fort Ticonderoga. And they put a substantial encampment there. In fact, most of the Americans were on Mount Independence. They had built a star-shaped fort there. They had put a hospital. They had put barracks. They had put what they call a horseshoe battery to defend anyone coming down the lake. They had put a floating bridge from Fort Ticonderoga over to Mount Independence so that traffic and supplies could flow back and forth between the fort and Mount Independence. They also constructed a chain and log boom north of the floating bridge so that that would preclude any sailing ships coming, enemy sailing ships coming from the northern end of Lake Champlain. So they had fortified it pretty well, and there was a substantial force there in 1776. However, when General Sinclair got there in June of 1777, his force was sadly lacking. There are different accounts where he said he had about 1,600 Continentals. Another account shows he had maybe 2,000 Continentals. And he had New England militia coming in and out of the fort, depending on the time of year or their enlistments. And there might have been another 900 to 1,000 militia. So if we could say in approximate numbers, he had about 3,000 men. Well, both Sinclair and General Schuyler, who was the department commander, realized that those fortifications at Ticonderoga and Mount Independence needed 10,000 men to be adequately defended. And so that's the rub. Sinclair does not have enough men to defend Ticonderoga in the event of an invasion. And that's exactly what he faced when Burgoyne started out in June of 1777. When Burgoyne lands his troops above Ticonderoga on July 1st, it's time that Sinclair evacuate the fort. What was the retreat like? Because the Patriots were in a mountainous area along a major river that had many streams. Would you tell us about the Patriot retreat and where the soldiers were retreating to? Sure. Let me just start by setting the stage for Burgoyne. When he lands his army north of Ticonderoga, he will put his British troops on the Ticonderoga or the west side. He will land his Germans under von Redesel on the east side with the idea of blocking the American retreat. Now, the American retreat will have to take place in two directions. They will retreat 
up Lake Champlain, which means they sail south to what they call Skeensboro, which is today Whitehall. But that is a waterborne evacuation. And so the majority of his army cannot go that way. They must retreat over what they call the military road, the Mount Independence Hubberton Military Road, which will bring him to Castleton. And I'm going to say Castleton, Vermont. As you know, at the time it was called the Hampshire Grants. Vermont didn't exist as a state per se, but for purposes of today, let's call it uh, Vermont. He will have to take his army over this road that is roughly constructed. It's got ruts. It's got uh, stumps of trees. It's a miserable road. It's not anything like we would think of today. It's very rough cut. And so he will have to make a retreat of about 20 miles from Mount Independence to Hubberton, from Hubberton to Castleton. And his original goal was to meet the remainder of his army that had sailed uh, south on Lake Champlain at Skeensboro, reunite the army, and meet up with Schuyler. That's his game plan. But things didn't go according to plan, did they? They didn't go according to plan at all. What happened was that when Burgoyne secures some of the outer fortifications of Fort Ticonderoga, his engineers spy a very important piece of terrain at Fort Ticonderoga, which is called uh, Sugarloaf Hill, or today it's called Mount Defiance. And a British engineer named William Twist will get up on top of that mountain and see that if they can get guns up there, they will be able to control Fort Ticonderoga and control Mount Independence. And that's exactly what the British do. Burgoyne's second in command is Major General William Phillips, who is trained as an artillerist. And he's a very, very competent artillerist. And he supposedly said, where a goat can go, a man can go, and where a man can go, he can drag a gun behind him. Now, we don't know for sure whether he actually said that, but one of uh, his only biographer that I know of said that if he didn't say it, he should have said it. And so uh, the British, in a matter of 24 hours, are able to build a road, get two guns up on top of Mount Defiance, and this is going to cause great consternation to Sinclair and his subordinate officers. He will call a council of war. They will decide to evacuate Fort Ticonderoga on the evening of July 5th and into the morning of July 6th. And they make a very hasty retreat. The British, when they capture Fort Ticonderoga and Mount Independence on the 6th, will notice the amount of material that has been left, ammunition, cannon, any matter of uh, foodstuffs, sheep and cattle are still walking around on Mount Independence. And so it's a very hasty retreat. Sinclair's army is demoralized by this retreat, but it is actually the best decision that he could have made. And Schuyler will agree with him. They both, by the way, will be court-martialed the following year for evacuating Ticonderoga. The Continental Congress had in mind that Ticonderoga was such a key that it should be maintained at all costs. George Washington is of the same opinion, but Washington has never been there. And so, despite this fact that it can't be defended, the Congress really feels that it should have been defended, and it gets Sinclair and Schuyler into some hot water. Uh, they're eventually exonerated after court-martial proceedings, but it was a little uh, upsetting to General Schuyler, to say the least, that his uh, decision was uh, questioned by men who really didn't know what was going on. Would you tell us about Colonel Ebenezer Francis and Colonel Seth Warner? What role did they play in this American retreat? Well, Colonel Seth Warner is a Green Mountain boy, as they say. He is from the Vermont area, the Hampshire Grants. He was with Ethan Allen at the uh, capture of Ticonderoga in 1775. He participated in the Canadian campaign to capture Montreal and Quebec. 
17, 75, 76. He was commander of the rear guard in 1776 when the Americans made their retreat from Canada. He is a very competent field officer. He's 34 years old. He is not a boastful type of person. He is very stoic. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, contemporary image, so we don't know what he looks like. But he was characterized as being about uh, six feet tall, muscular, and someone that the men looked up to for his moral values and his leadership ability. So he is the person selected by Sinclair to command the rear guard of the American army. And he will take that command at a place called Hubberton. Ebenezer Francis is a colonel of the 11th Massachusetts Continental Line. He has served in the Revolution since the early days, the Siege of Boston. And he is also a very competent field commander. He has commanded the rear guard from the retreat at Mount Independence all the way to Hubberton. He was the man in the back holding back the British onslaught coming after the Americans. But at Hubberton, Seth Warner is given the command and Ebenezer Francis will fight under him. A third man, Colonel Nathan Hale, who is the commander of the second New Hampshire Continental Line, will also be someone that will be in this fight, although his record is less than stellar at Hubberton. But those three colonels are uh, going to be the the officers who will be responsible for commanding at Hubberton. What is a rear guard? I mean, what is it supposed to do and how many men are a part of it? The purpose of a rear guard is to protect the rear of an army while it's retreating. And they are to sort of uh, protect the back of the army. They may have a firefight with the enemy if they're coming on, but they're basically to stall an oncoming force so that the main army can escape to wherever its destination is to be. So how many men are a part of this rear guard? Uh, At Hubberton, Colonel Seth Warner had about 900 men under his command who were what I would call effectives. He also had about 300 men who were stragglers, who were disabled, who were sick, and who were just uh, lagging behind the main army. So he had to contend with this situation as well. But in terms of effectives, he has about 900 men to protect the remainder of the American army. And he makes a very, very good decision at Hubberton to remain an extra day. Sinclair originally wanted Seth Warner to retreat with the army as it retreated and to stay a couple of miles behind the main army. But Seth Warner sees that he's got about 300 stragglers in all sorts of conditions. Some are sick, some are slightly wounded, some are inebriated. And so he takes an extra night to let these men rest and get some food and uh, sort of shepherd them so that they're not lost to the enemy. If he had done as Sinclair originally wanted him to, those men would have been abandoned uh, to the British. And Warner makes a decision to stay an extra day, an extra night at Hubberton, and that's what results in the battle that takes place. Before we get to the battle, how many British soldiers, German soldiers, and Native American warriors are in pursuit of the American army? The man who is pursuing the Americans, is Brigadier Simon Fraser. He is 48 years old. He is commanding what is called the Advanced Corps of Burgoyne's Army. And this is an elite unit in Burgoyne's Army. It is made up of 10 companies of grenadiers, 10 companies of light infantry, and his own 24th Regiment of Foot, in addition to a company commanded by his nephew called the Company of Select Marksmen. And this is an excellent unit in Burgoyne's army. Burgoyne has a lot of confidence in Simon Fraser. Uh, He's 48 years old. He is a veteran of the French and Indian War. He served under General Wolfe 
at Quebec, and so he has combat experience. He will take, of his advanced corps, he will select 850 men. Uh, that 850-man unit will be composed of his Grenadier Battalion, 10 companies, and his Light Infantry Battalion, 10 companies, and two companies from his own 24th Regiment of Foot. Now, Frazier has the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He is the commander of the 24th Foot. But in this campaign, he has been promoted to Brigadier uh, essentially a brigadier general, but in many cases uh, the title is brigadier for, for this uh, particular situation. He will be followed in his trail by General von Redefel, and he will have 1,100 Germans. Some of them will be from his own regiment, uh, as well as some Jaegers and Grenadiers. Jaegers are very important in this particular situation. They are an elite fighting force. They are light infantry. They carry a short-barreled rifle. They were originally developed by Frederick the Great. And uh, Jaeger in German means huntsman. So they are recruited from the forests of Germany. They are famous for their prowess in hunting and shooting. And uh, this is going to be a very important unit there are about 100 Jaeger that come along with the Germans in the rear of Fraser, and there are about 1,100 of them. So it sounds like, in terms of effective men, men who are able to fight, the British, Germans, and Native Americans greatly outnumber Seth Warner and the rear guard of the American force. Well, if they're all at the battlefield at the same time, but that's not what happens. Okay, I think we're ready. Would you tell us about the Battle of Hubbardton? In the early morning hours, just before dawn, the British have been pursuing the American rear guard over the Mount Independence Hubbardton military road. Now, Frazier was in such a hurry to pursue the Americans that he did not bring any additional ammunition any additional food, any surgeons or medical supplies, and he did not bring any artillery because of the terrain of the road. It, as I mentioned before, it had stumps and ruts, and it was not conducive to hauling artillery. So he is strictly an infantry unit moving quickly in pursuit of the Americans. The Germans who will be behind him are much slower. And this will frustrate Frazier to some extent. Frazier, as I said, is a brigadier. Von Vardesel is a major general. If the German general gets to the field, he is going to be the commanding officer. So Frazier has it on his mind, as I see it, that he wants to start this fight as soon as possible because he wants the glory of defeating the rebels. Now, Seth Warner on the morning of the 7th, is getting ready to form a rear guard as he is commanded. And so his men are not, in a sense, ready to fight a battle. He has them in columns on the Castleton Road, ready to march behind the American army to Castleton and follow his commander, Sinclair. But some skirmishing starts on the military road and he is forced to fight a battle that he did not want to fight to begin with. There's a hill on the battlefield. It's now called Monument Hill. It did not have a name at the time. He does not have his troops on that hill. He has them east of the hill on the Castleton Road in a column. And so he is unprepared to fight a battle. On the east side of Monument Hill is a valley, a low valley, which there's a creek that flows through there called Sucker Brook. That is where the stragglers and the sick men have been laying around since the day before. There's a company of New Hampshire men down there guarding them. I think there might have been some other troops down there, and they have a makeshift fortification at Sucker Brook 
to uh, guard the military road. Frazier in the advance will be his uh, two companies of the 24th Foot under Major Robert Grant. Behind them will be the Light Infantry under Major Alexander Lindsay, the Earl of Balcaris. This will be Lindsay's first fight as an officer. And behind him will be the Grenadier Battalion under Major John Ocklin. And so they are coming down the military road from Ticonderoga, and they will run into these troops that are in the valley of Sucker Brook, and immediately there will be gunfire, and um, Major Grant will go down, about 20-some of his regulars will go down, and Seth Warner knows he's in for a fight. Frazier will take the Light Infantry Battalion and charge up Monument Hill on the east slope. He gains the slope, and he gains the crest. At that point, the Americans will come forward from the military road. In other words, they will face to the right and attack the British coming up over the crest of the hill. And it's almost like two freight trains are going to collide there at the crest of the hill, and they will fight a very, very close-ordered engagement for at least an hour. The British will push the Americans back to what Fraser calls a hill of lower eminence. And if you're on the battlefield today, that would be approximately where the visitor center is located. And the Americans will put up somewhat of a fight there, but eventually have to retreat across the Castleton Road to where there is a log fence that had been constructed by a farmer in the area called the John Selleck. And the Americans will get behind this log fence and continue to fire on the British at uh, one account has it at 60 yards. Meanwhile, Frazier will call up his grenadiers under Auckland to come down the military road, cross Sucker Brook, gather up as many of those stragglers who haven't fled into the woods and come around the American right flank using the military road. And they will outflank Seth Warner's Green Mountain Regiment and push it back so that you have almost like a U-shaped situation for the Americans where they have a front and then they have two side flanks that they have refused. The Grenadiers will attack on the American left, the light infantry will attack on the center and somewhat to the American right, and it's a battle that lasts about an hour and a half. Frazier's left flank is up in the air, it's not anchored on anything, and the Americans seize the opportunity to attack Frazier's left flank, and that attack is carried out by Benjamin Titcomb of the 2nd New Hampshire Continental Line. He is commanding that portion of the New Hampshire line because Nathan Hale is down in the valley, and Nathan Hale has sort of absconded from the field. He doesn't show up until after the battle is over with. At that point, General Von Radezel comes on the field, and he has been moving quickly with a grenadier company and his Jaeger about 80 Grenadiers and about 100 Jaeger. And he has the hunting horns of the Jaeger that were being played. And uh, one account says the Germans are singing hymns and really causing quite a commotion. They come in on Frazier's left flank, and they totally surprise the Americans. And they form sort of a crescent around the American right flank and collapse it. At this point, there is pressure from the grenadiers on the American left. And there's one account that says that Seth Warner trips over a tree root and goes down. And that causes his men to become very concerned, and they think Seth Warner is down dead, and they lose uh, hope in the battle and start to retreat. Seth Warner was not 
even wounded in the fight. It was just an accident, and he gets back up. But by that time, uh, cohesion has been lost. In the center of the American line is Ebenezer Francis, who we discussed a little while ago. He is holding the center of the line, but he is shot down. And that causes the center of the line to collapse. And the entire American line gives way with the pressure of the grenadiers on their left and the Germans on their right. And it just it becomes a complete tactical victory for the British and the Germans as the Americans retreat over Pittsford Ridge. Supposedly, Seth Warner says, rally on Manchester. We'll meet in Manchester. And he means Manchester, Vermont. And so that is what will happen. The Americans will retreat over Pittsford Ridge, which is a very high eminence in the area. And they will rally at Manchester. And as they say, they will live to fight another day, which will be at Saratoga. Why do you think that the Battle of Hubberton was the rearguard action that saved America? Well, maybe that's a little bit expansive. It definitely is the battle that saved the Northern Army, because if Warner had not put up that kind of a stubborn fight at Hubberton, if the British and the Germans were able to catch up with Sinclair's army near Castleton, that army was a demoralized force. They might have been able to destroy the entire American Northern Army. The army of Sinclair was saved by the action at Hubberton. Sinclair's army couldn't get to Skeensboro because Burgoyne had come with the rest of his army and just sort of defeated the men that were at Skeensboro. But Sinclair was able to retreat to Rutland and in a circuitous route were able to get to Fort Edward where he linked up with Philip Schuyler and those men, those continental troops, formed the core of the American army that would be reconstituted in the upcoming weeks and would fight at Saratoga. So I see Hubbardton as the battle that saved the Northern Army and perhaps America because without the victory at Saratoga, the French may not have come in to the war in 1778. Also, the British casualties are overlooked in the campaign. Frazier had 850 men, primarily grenadiers and light infantry. These are the flower of Burgoyne's army. The casualties at Hubberton for the British were 194 men. Over 20% of those men were casualties. These are men that cannot be replaced easily by John Burgoyne. And so they lost a significant part of the advance corps at Hubberton, which is the principal fighting force of Burgoyne's army. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Bruce, Is there any way that the Americans could have defeated the British at the Battle of Hubberton? And if so, how would their victory have changed the course of the American War for Independence? The Americans could have defeated the British if they had decided that Hubberton was going to be a place for battle. As I mentioned before, the Americans were ready to retreat on the morning of July 7th. They had not fortified Monument Hill. Now, Monument Hill is a very, very prominent place on the battlefield, and it is a place where you could station your troops, probably put some big, some fortifications, and be ready to accept an attack, because the military road comes right into the valley of Sucker Brook, and Monument Hill is right there. If the British chose to attack, as they did, the Americans, 
and the Americans were on the quote-unquote military crest of the hill, they could have given them a defeat there. They could have held the hill, I'm sure, and defeated the British as they were attacking because, as I make a point in the book, Frazier's personality was that of impetuousness. He wanted all the laurels. He did not want to share it with the Germans. And so if he had, and this is a time warp, <laughs> if he had decided to attack immediately, he probably would have been pushed back with significant losses and may have been forced to retreat. So I think the Americans could have won that battle with proper deployment of their troops. They were not deployed in a manner, in fact, that would have allowed them to do that. Now, if they had defeated the British, would that have made a difference? Probably not in the whole scheme of the campaign because of John Burgoyne. John Burgoyne was steadfast in his mission to capture Albany, even when he knew that Howe would not come up the Hudson River, he was still going to pursue the campaign. In fact, he issued a proclamation to his troops that, in effect, uh, one of the quotes is, this army will not retreat. So he had no inclination to retreat. If he had been defeated at Hubberton, I would postulate that he would still continue to pursue his campaign. You have to remember, he was soundly defeated at Bennington on uh, August 16th, 1777, when he lost over 700 Germans to John Stark. That did not deter Burgoyne from crossing the Hudson River at Saratoga, which is now Schuylerville, a month later. And so he continued to pursue the quest to get to Albany even after a very, very significant defeat at Bennington. So while I would theorize that the Americans could have won the Battle of Hubberton, I think Burgoyne would have continued the campaign, and it probably would have ended the same way it, in fact, did end at Saratoga in October of 1777. What's next for you? What are you currently working on? I am working now on the Cherry Valley Massacre. That occurred in November of 1778. It was a dramatic uh, event south of the Mohawk Valley where a number of civilians, men, women, and children, were massacred by the Butler's Rangers under Walter Butler and uh, Indians under Joseph Brandt. And I want to put it in the context of all the raids of 1778. I think it's an area that has been overlooked because in 1777, you have a major campaign in the Mohawk Valley. You have the Battle of Oriskany. You have Fort Stanwyck and the Burgoyne campaign. And then in 1779, the other bookend to that is Sullivan's campaign, where he tries to wipe out the Iroquois. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your company, America's History, and how we can get in contact with you? The best place would be our website, which is America's History LLC.com. And we have information out there about our tours for 2016 as well as our conference. I have to say, our conference on the American Revolution is already sold out. My email address is my name at AOL.com, Bruce Venter at AOL.com. Bruce Venter. Thank you so much for taking us through the Saratoga campaign and the Battle of Hubberton. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Liz, very much for this opportunity. Control of the Hudson River Corridor was crucial for the British and Patriot armies. Control of the river meant easy transportation for troops and supplies and access to New England, Canada, and New York City. Although both armies vied for control of the Hudson River, no one army ever controlled its entire length. The Patriots stood firm at Albany and the British at New York City. The river north and in between those places changed possession throughout the war, but mostly it served as a raiding ground for Patriot and Loyalist bands. The desire to control the Hudson River Corridor led to the Battle of Saratoga. And as Bruce points out, the Battle of Hubberton played a really important role in the Saratoga campaign. Although a British victory, 
the battle inflicted a 20% casualty rate on Burgoyne's best battle units. The loss of these soldiers really hurt the British Army when it met the Patriot forces at Saratoga. Burgoyne's three-prong attack to capture the Hudson River did not go as planned. Neither Henry Clinton nor Barry St. Ledger arrived with the reinforcements and supplies that Burgoyne's force needed at Saratoga. As a result, Burgoyne's army did the best it could, but ultimately, it had to surrender to the Patriots. You can find more information about Bruce, his book, The Battle of Hubberton, plus links to the other books and historic sites we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, benfranklinsworld.com slash 071. If you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please consider supporting the show by joining its crowdfunding campaign. Your contributions will help offset the cost of producing this show, and it will help the show continue to sound great. For more information, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement or text support BF World 233444. And if you'd like to help support the show but can't do so financially, no worries. If you visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement or text support BF World 233444, the campaign page lists several non financial ways that you can help us out. Finally, do you think Saratoga was the turning point of the American Revolution? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.